Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm glad to have you back. Today we're gonna to be talking about IVs. So we're gonna be doing real life technique on how to start IVs and be good at them. We're not gonna be doing nursing school 101 with a rubber arm and rope veins and track marks all over it and say, here you go. No, we're gonna do real live demonstration. I'm gonna let my wife, who is a master IV starter, Come in, stick me. We're going to show a couple different angles so you can see it from every different view. We're going to go through it from start to finish. We're going to talk about everything A to Z where you can walk into your next room and you can feel confident that you're going to be a master IV starter. So let's get into the action. Let's get started. Hello, Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, my name is Larry. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> I'm here to start your ID to the IV today. Um, so I just wanted to tell you before I did it. Excuse me. Is this my first IV? Um, no, this is not my first IV on a real person. Um, no, I've done this before. Sure. Yes. No. Many times, <laughs> I've I've always I've always done really good. So today's not going to be any different. I don't think. So let, let's go ahead and and let's get started, and we'll see see if we can get you fixed up soon. All right. Let's get started. How you're going to become a pro IV starter? A couple basics first. Let's talk about why do we even need IVs? What does an IV do for us? So IVs, small catheter that we stick down into a blood vessel. This allows us direct shot into the bloodstream. Medications, fluids, blood products, all these things now we can give directly into the body. So it's a direct highway. It's a very essential piece in healthcare. We need them. It gets no better than that. So let's talk about the IV itself. Remember when you're talking about IVs, we've got a range of sizes. Yes, size does matter. Larger for some things, smaller for others. Numbers are backwards. So when we talk anywhere from a 14 gauge to a 26 gauge, the smaller the number, the bigger the needle size. The higher the number, the smaller the needle. Backwards, right? got to think about that sometimes and I think the more you use them the more you'll see what I'm talking about because depending on where you're working at sometimes you'll never ever use a 14 or a 16 sometimes um, trauma patients ED EMS patients they love the big gauge needles because why you can do anything with them um, there's no limitations to that they flow fluid fast um, when you start getting into the little needles people think well it's kind and you know, it won't hurt as much. Well, this may be true, but if you put a 24 or 26 in somebody, there's limitations to what you can do with it. Yes, we can give little simple pushes here and there of certain medicines, but you can't give large volumes. You can't give certain products. Blood's not going to flow through a 24 very well. Um, so they're all color coded and universally color coded. You'll see orange is a 14 gauge, gray is 16, green. 18, 20s pink, so on and so forth. I think for the most common middle of the road, a 20 gauge is a go-to. You can do pretty much universally anything. Unless it's somebody that is requiring huge amounts of volume, then you want an 18 gauge or even a 16 because they'll flow a little bit better. But these are going to be anywhere you go. You're going to have these ranges and you're going to have the color coded to see them. So what do you need besides that? Simple, you know, IV start kit is going to come with most of the stuff you need your cleaners, your swabs, your uh, tourniquets, you're going to have a dressing, tape, and gauze. So, everything basically that you need to get started. Choose your IV. Remember, choose the size that is appropriate for your patient. Don't choose no 16 for 
frail granny that can't hold a 24 barely. It's never going to work. You're never going to be successful. So make sure it's appropriate for what you're using it for and for the patient itself. And then you're going to need gloves, a flush, and a J-loop connector or some type of line that's going to connect to your actual IV itself to be able to hook the meds up to. So after that, let's talk about this. Where's the best place to stick it? Ironic question here. So on the diagrams here, notice that just there's a highway of vessels. We got vessels everywhere. So things to keep in mind, just like I said before, size, visibility makes a big difference. If you can see it, you can stick it better. If you can feel it, even better than that. Age of the patient makes a difference as to what's going to hold up well. You know, take into account their preference. If they say they absolutely do not want an IV somewhere, try to respect their wish if you can. If you can't, then, you know, make sure you know to tell them you're going to make every attempt you can to put it where they like that too, but, you know, ultimately you do what's best for the patient. And then think about two previous IV sites. If they've had one, two in the hand, Switch it up, put it somewhere else. Um, these are kind of, you know, highways of maps here. And you'll see on the maps, some of them are much larger than others. And that's what you want to shoot for. You want to shoot for the bigger vessels because they're going to hold IVs better. These little teeny tiny ones, they're not going to last you a long time. So, you know, you start looking at some of these basilics and cephalic veins that come up in the arms here. You know, the ED folks, they love these. They're go-tos all the time. You know, they're not the best for people that are gonna have them long-term. Why? Because they constantly bend their arms back and forth. And what's that tube doing in there? It's just sitting there kinking away, back and forth. You'll be running fluids, they'll have the arms crossed, pumps just beeping away because it's now the IV catheter is occluded in the arm. Ideally, if you can get in a straightaway here, this would be ideal. They can move around, they can do what they want to, and you know, it's not gonna kink off, it's staying in a straight spot. The hands work pretty good, just depending on where they're going, or the back of the wrist sometimes. It all depends on the patient itself and how they're doing, what they're moving, and you know, what kind of medicines they're getting. Let's talk about complications real quick. These are kind of biggies for peripheral IVs. Peripheral IV can go bad at any point in time, and there's a couple of scenarios. So I think most of the time we hear infiltration. So this is when either the IV has gone into the vessel and maybe it's come back out of the other side or maybe it's pulled back out of the vessel if the patient's moved around a lot. Either which way, that IV catheter is not in the vessel anymore. And it's leaking fluids out into the tissues that surround the vessel. Now, these infiltration is considered a non-vesicant. And what I mean by that is these are not irritating fluids that are gonna damage the tissue around. And that's the difference between a non-vesicant and a vesicant. Um, when you're talking about that, you need to at least have some knowledge of what your vesicant meds are because these are the meds that are gonna do the most damage. And we really don't like to run them in peripheral IVs if we don't have to. But sometimes we do what we got to do in the meantime, and you just need to know. So non-vesicant meds, when they leak out, most of the time, we're just going to kind of put compresses on them, elevate them, let the swelling go down. And you'll notice on those sites, they're going to be cool from where the fluids are running. They're going to be swollen. Sometimes they could be red, but most of the time, that's what you're going to see. Now, when we talk about vesicant meds, the extravasation now that is when the fluid is also leaked out, same principle, but you got this vesicant that's a damaging medication. Now what we're talking about is damage to the skin and the tissue. So this leads to infections, tissue necrosis, um, you know, eventually could, depending on how bad it was, loss of function in a limb, and you know, worst case scenario would be amputation. Some of these medicines are worse than others, and there's antidotes that we can give. Pharmacy can help you with that. Your provider can help you with that. And then, um, you know, keeping track of that site. We need to mark it, and then we need to kind of constantly document what's going on with that site. 
Now, depending on IV stuff, so you know your IV is bad, if you've got a vesicant mid, sometimes if you know it's a vesicant and you know you got to give an antidote, sometimes before you pull that IV, you may need to give some of that antidote through the IV that is also bad, but that is to get that antidote into that surrounding tissue so it can work better. Does that make sense? So that's the difference there. Now, another common complication is phlebitis. And look on the diagram here, you'll see that big whopping red vein. So phlebitis is an irritation of the vessel. This can come from either an IV that is too big for the actual vein, and you say, how's it too big, but it's in there. Well, you want your IV catheter to sit inside of your vessel, but you don't necessarily want it to sit in the whole thing, filling up the whole thing all the time. Because if the patient's moving around, that catheter is sliding back and forth inside of that vessel, and it's actually damaging the inside of the vessel walls. So if it's too big and it just barely fits, rubbing, 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 it causes irritation, and eventually that vessel is going to want to do what it does, and it's going to want to clot because it says there's an injury to it. So then now we have a clot in that area, which is painful. And phlebitis, you can do it from IV site. It can be sometimes medicines that are too acidotic or too alkaline. They really irritate the vessels. Um, and you'll notice phlebitis is characteristically, it follows the track of the vessel. So, you know, somebody that has predominant veins, you're going to see it better in. But, you know, classic sign is they've got redness and pain that follows that vessel. Maybe not all the way up the arm, but sometimes it can, depending on how long it's run and how irritated. But they're going to have a lot of pain, a lot of redness. So we're going to want to discontinue that site, and you continue to monitor it. You're going to do compresses, probably moist compress, and you're going to just choose you a different site from there. Now, if it's the medicine that's doing this, we need to make sure that we're either diluting the medicine, slowing it down, something to combat this so we don't have this happen again. All right, so this is pretty cool. We're gonna do a real live demonstration here. And so what she's doing right now is she's putting the tourniquet on. So this will help any um, vessels pop up as she's getting her supplies together. She's kind of scoping out, seeing what she likes. We're gonna hit this middle of the arm area because remember we said there's not a lot of bending there. So she sees what she sees. She's gonna go ahead and clean that site. Go ahead and let it dry. If you don't let it dry real good, it makes a sticky surface. So she's gonna be using a 22 gauge just because she don't wanna abuse me too bad, hopefully. So notice how she's kinda of eyeballing it, pulling the skin taut to be able to see. Once she sees what she sees, she's using her needle hand to pull the skin back with the fingers, tight with the top. Look at that angle. She slides in and gets the flash. Once she sees a little flash, she's gonna go a hair bit further before she pulls that needle back. Beautiful job. You're gonna hold it in place. You don't technically have to hold it while you're getting your other supplies. I think have it for most people. She's gonna go ahead and flush it and draw back and see if it pulls blood and that it does. She's gonna go ahead and flush it through. If a IV does not pull back, it's not that it's not good. Sometimes there's a valve there or it's a very little needle. This one seems to do just fine. So we're going to put a dressing over top of it to secure your hard work. Yep. So you have a tegaderm dressing and then you'll want to secure your J loop some form or fashion just to keep it from pulling or tugging. And you'll want to cover up that hub there at the end as well. Just like that, new money. She's got us fixed up, beautiful IV, and just like that. Quick clarification on what I said while we were watching the demonstration. I said when you get flashback, you need to advance your catheter, meaning the needle, a little bit further. Now, this is gonna vary greatly over time and how people do things. You'll get a flow and you won't think twice about this. But just put this in your mind. So I'm showing you right here, there's a needle and it is now pierced into that vessel, right? So 
that's all good and now you have you've got blood return into your chamber right so you've pierced it now you have blood that comes up here and you've got your flashback here right so that's all good and great but think about what's around your needle so you've got the plastic sheathing which is your actual IV catheter because remember you don't leave the, the needle in the skin you're just leaving the plastic catheter so if you look at it from this way your plastic catheter is not all the way into the vessel yet, right? It hasn't pierced that. So if you tried to advance it right there, you're not going to be able to. So what do we need to do? This is the part where it comes into play. So let's say we stick a little bit further now into the skin. Now what we should see is your plastic sheathing for your catheter is actually inside the vessel wall. So now when you go to slide your catheter in, it's going to be able to take a path straight inside. As to before, if you don't have it all the way into it, you're going to go to advance it, and it's just going to bunch that plastic up because it's trying to go in, but it's not in there yet. So I just want to add a little clarification to that so it made a little bit more sense, and hopefully this does. All right, people, that's a wrap for today. I hope you enjoyed the IV session we did and learning all the bits and pieces about it in a down and dirty format um, and hopefully you're going to take the information and you're going to be able to go out start doing ivs with a little more confidence and then you keep practicing keep doing it that's the only way you're ever going to get better is if you start doing it and start practicing so i want to hear your comments about it let me know what you thought about it and if you have any questions let me know if you haven't subscribed to the channel what are you waiting on? Get out there and do it. That's going to help us grow and keep putting more content out. Um, and as always, keep up the strong work, and we'll see you on the next round.